I have seen all the things that are done under the sun. All of them are meaningless. A chasing after the wind. Hey, well, good morning. Aren't you glad you came to church this morning? Man, what a sweet presence of the Lord in a time of worship. Uh, if you have your Bibles, take them out and turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 7. While you're turning there, just one, one big thing I want you to just kind of put uh, in your brain. A month from now, uh, on August uh, 27th, we'll be doing kind of a grand opening uh, to our community. And we're going to encourage you to invite someone or a group of someones, get them in here, friends, people that you've been praying about. We'll have some information that you can pass out to them and inviting them to church. Uh, but we're believing that week, weekend special. We're also going to call it our grand opening to our community. Hopefully we'll have some things. Pray for our awesome uh, internet network that sometimes drops in and out. Hopefully we'll get our drum cage. Some of those extra things are still coming in, but we're launching to the community. So if you could help us be in prayer number one for that weekend, and how many believe in that hearts and lives are gonna be changed for the kingdom that week and God's gonna do an amazing work. So, so be thinking ahead of time who you can invite and who you can pray for for that weekend, amen. Hey, we are in week three of Chasing After the Wind, and we're looking at this book in Ecclesiastes called, uh, written by Solomon. And Solomon in week one, he said, so far everything that he's tried, everything that he's pursued, everything under the sun was, was meaningless. And you get the picture, he's nearing the end of his life, he's reflecting on all his money, all his fame, all his treasures that he's, he's accumulated, and he gets to the end and he realizes that nothing can fill that void. Aren't you thankful that the Holy Spirit comes in and fills that void and gives us purpose and destiny and calling? Last week, we looked at there's a time that we're given and, and we're to be stewards of that time and that God gives us a certain amount of time. And if you missed that sermon, I encourage you to go back and watch it. Pastor Larry did some awesome dance moves as well for that, for that sermon and it will bless you. Uh, today is a little bit different. Um, our, writing, our writing team has taken us to one of kind of my favorite interactions actually in the New Testament. So we're going to be reflecting in the New Testament uh, on a topic that I've talked about quite a bit. So I'm really excited and passionate about this, and it's going to be a lot of information. You guys ready? You guys ready, ready to roll on that? Okay, a couple of you. All right. So we're, we're going to take a couple of thoughts that Solomon gives us in this Old Testament, and then we're going to, we're going to kind of mirror it and look at how Jesus and disciples face some similar circumstance. So our text today, Ecclesiastes chapter 7, and then we're going to hit some in 11, and then we're going to jump into some New Testament applications. So stand with me for the reading of God's Word uh, this morning. Ecclesiastes chapter 7. We're going to pick up at verse 13. Verse 13. If you got it, say, I'm good. Okay. Consider what God has done. Who can straighten what he has made crooked? When times are good, be happy. When times are bad, consider this. God has made one as well as the other. How many know times can be good and bad and you've been in those seasons and back and forth? Ecclesiastes chapter 11, flip over a couple pages. Verse three, if the clouds are full of water, they pour rain on the earth, whether a tree falls in the south or to the north in the place where it falls, there it will lie. Look at verse four. Whoever watches the wind, so whoever's focused, who's ever focused there, whoever watches the wind will not plant. Whoever looks at the cloud, focuses on the clouds, will not reap. As you do not know the path of the wind or the body, how it's formed in the mother's womb, so you cannot understand the work of God, the maker of all things. Now we're going to take a big jump over to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. That day when evening came, he said this to the disciples, let us go over to the other side. How many thankful he calls us? Let us go over to the other side, leaving the crowd behind. They took him along just as he was in the boat. There was also other boats with them. A furious squall came up. The waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. And the disciples woke him and said, Teacher, don't you care if we drowned? Father, today I pray as we look at your word, as we talk about something, these storms and these trials and these crooked things that we face, 
God, I pray that our heart would be stirred this morning, that we realize that you are Lord, that you are King, that you are the author of life and purpose and destiny. And God, this word would produce transformation in our heart and minds. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen, amen. As you're seated, tell your neighbor your face looks good. I get really brilliant questions. You shaved. <laughs> That's a good question. Thank you for asking. Thank, thank, you for, thank you for asking that question. Man, it was hot and beardy and everybody says you lost 10 years and 10 pounds. So I tend to think counterintuitive. So you're saying the beard was old and fat? Is that what, is that what you're going, all right. All right, some of you are like, I like the beard. Well, my wife didn't, she trumps you. All right, she didn't. All right, what, what we read this morning, that's moving on, we gotta move. What we read this morning, there's this crazy progression in Ecclesiastes, he talks about, man, we live and we travel on these crooked paths and there's good times and there's tough times. And it's kind of this roller coaster that there happens. And then in chapter 11, he points out that there's these clouds and the winds that show up in the distance. And there's this tension because I'm called to purpose. I'm, I'm called to plant. I'm called to scatter seed and sow and reap a harvest. And the wisdom of Solomon, he, he tells us, I can't focus on the storm clouds. I, I can't do that and be focused on the wind and the things because it will distract me from my work and what God has called me to do. It will distract me from effectively reaping a harvest. Then we're gonna get with the disciples, with Jesus, and it says, this furious squall arrives and it comes up in the wind. And so this morning, we're gonna look at some realities of the storm. We're gonna kind of dive in and just say, hey, these are facts about storms, and then we're gonna get very practical, look at maybe how the disciples struggled through this, what they did, what they forgot, and then we're gonna give some solutions, amen? If you have your notes and following along with us on the YouVersion app, you can take them out. Number one, first fact about storm, Storms will come. It's not very good news. I know. The storms will come. Now, we're going to give you the solution right now. Go ahead and put in parentheses next to that. Put a little equal sign if you're taking notes. Here's the solution. Recall the past. Recall the past. For the disciples, this point, Jesus had been performing miracles, and they too have been on somewhat of a roller coaster They've been kind of accused by the religious leaders and even some family members and some people of the law in chapter three. And yet at the same time, this massive crowd is following him and he's been teaching all day. And he says, all right, let's get in the boat and let's go, let's go to the other side. And we need to venture to the region of the garrison. And so late, kind of in that late afternoon, early evening, they head out to the other side. And as they're going, it says a furious squall or storm comes up. How many know, like our point, storms will, in this life will come. Storm, storms will come. My mom used to say, it's not whether uh, you'll face a storm, it's whether you're approaching one, you're in the middle of one, or you're coming out of one. It's just, you're, you're gonna face storms in life. Storms will come. Many of them come out of out of nowhere, and we get hit with all of a sudden massive issues maybe in our life, our physical health, our marriage, our kids, the school, the job, parents, family, things going on, furious things start to happen. Storms will come, and often they come quickly and without warning. Now, if you look at the location of the Sea of Galilee, just to give you a little bit, I'm kind of like a meteorologist, just if you're wondering. This, I'm not. The Sea of Galilee, it lies 680 feet below sea level, and yet it's bound, surrounded by hills, especially on the east, high, east side. And those hills are said to get as high as 2,000 feet in elevation. So you have the semi-tropical air at sea level, and then it mixes with the, the cool air at the top, and somebody say, that's a barometric pressure nightmare, right? And so when wind happens, it kind of funnels in, and these storms become, come on the, on the sea very quickly as these contrasting air masses meet, and they can come without warning. And what they do is they put small watercraft in immediate danger, in immediate danger. And so these disciples are, they're caught in a squall, and it says that they're terrified because they're nearly swamped. 
And you have to keep in mind that some of these guys on the boat are seasoned fishermen. And yet they're, they're terrified. They're terrified, even growing up on the sea, they're scared. They feel as if they're gonna die. Don't storms do that? They're kind of they're crazy and life is difficult and it can be scary. And at the same time, you gotta feel for the disciples because they make this commitment to follow Jesus. They leave everything behind and they go and follow the rabbi. And now they make even the, the upfront commitment. Okay, he said, get in the boat. So we're gonna get in the boat and we're going to go to the other side. Let's go to the other side and leave the crowd behind. Most of us in the room, those of you who love Jesus, who are Christ followers, you've made similar commitments in your life at one point and the other. Where Christ starts to move on your heart and life, how many thankful you leave that old crowd behind? Anybody have that part of your story? You leave that behind and it's, it's exciting and God does stuff and he moves and, and amazing things start to happen as you make this commitment. But at the same time, how you know when you make that commitment, there's a target on your back. The enemy doesn't like you to prosper. He doesn't like you to be successful in your walk with Christ. And how many know we face storms and those storms can be crazy, crazy attacks, crazy, difficult, scary stuff goes on. And look at, here's what I wanna focus on. Look at the first response of disciples. It says, a furious squall came up in verse 37. The waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in stern, sleeping on a soggy pillow, just, just not, even, not even concerned about anything. And it says the disciples woke him and the first thing they said, teacher, don't you care? Teacher, don't you care? There's something inside of us that when like a situation arises that's tough, that's difficult, maybe even things that don't go as planned, our expectations are smashed, we have a tendency, if we're not careful, to question the compassion and goodness of God. When things don't go our way, we don't get the report that we longed for, we don't get the thing in the relationship, it didn't go like we thought it would go. When things happen, sometimes our first response is to say, God, don't you care? God, I thought you loved me. Don't you care about me? God, where are you? God, are you sleeping right now? Because I've been crying out to you. What, what are you? God, if you were really good and compassionate, well, then I wouldn't have to face this, this, and this, and you can fill in the blank. And we start to doubt that God cares. We start to doubt that he's our security. We start to doubt that he's our protection. The scary thing is we start to doubt that he's all powerful. Why? Because the situation we're facing right now is hard. It's difficult and it's heavy. And if we're really honest, there's five other situations coming right behind it. It's weighing us down. And what happens is our attention focuses merely on the cloud, merely on the wind, not on the fact that God is the God of purpose. And Solomon says, when you do that, when you focus on the cloud and when you focus on the wind, you can't do what I've called you to do. You can't sow and scatter seed. You can't plow like I've called you to go forward. You see, we, we get what I call tunnel vision. Anybody guilty of tunnel vision? You just see, you see that thing. You only see that present circumstance. In tunnel vision, I, I, do, I don't know about you, I do this argument. God, I'm doing all of this stuff. Why is this stuff happening? Anybody had that conversation? Only four of us. Everyone else is holier than me. God, you don't care. Where are you, Jesus? You're sleeping. You see, tunnel vision is narrow. It only looks at the present circumstance. And I will tell you, it's hard in a storm because the squalls look big and the waves coming over the boat. But I wanna give you just a really practical way. I talk about this a lot, but a really practical way to combat combat tunnel vision, the, the tunnel vision of doubt and fear. Tunnel vision focuses on the present circumstance I think you need to expand, and I wanna challenge you to recall the past. To recall the past. To trust in what you've seen and experienced God do in your life. Look at what disciples had seen just in Mark's version of this story in the first four chapters. They've seen him drive out impure spirits at Capernaum. They've seen him heal Simon's mother-in-law. He healed all those who came to him and drove out many demons. He healed the man with leprosy. He heals and forgives the man lower through the roof. How many remember that story where they do a construction project as Jesus is teaching? 
And literally the guy's been lame and, and he says, take up your mat and walk and imagine the, like he, they saw that, they were, they, they were there. He heals the man with the shriveled hand on the Sabbath. All of these miracles had taken place, watch, and they had been eyewitnesses to them. What happens is it's easy to look at the situation, the tunnel vision, and immediately we say, God, where are you? If you were good, are you sleeping? And we forget all the things, all the miracles, all the things that he's done in our lives. I wanna challenge you that when you get tunnel vision, start recalling your past. How many can think where you were when God saved you? Think about where you were when he saved you. Think about how he extended mercy that you didn't deserve and grace that you didn't deserve. Think about those times where you heard his voice. Think about those times when he used you, those times when he healed you. Anybody been healed in here? Think about those times where he protected you. You have a testimony and a story. And again, we, we talked about this a lot. We, we went over this in, in Christmas time. Sometimes, especially that we, when we've been a part of church for a long time, we forget that we were messed up. I know you all are holy in here, but you forget that you were messed up. You forget that you were addicted. You forget that you were a cheater. You forget that you were stuck up with pride. You forget that you were blinded by things of the world. You forget that you were dead in your trespasses and grace came and found you and God rescued you. I'm telling you, in the storm, all of a sudden all that victory goes out the window because we only see the battle. And so I got to thinking, what if in the middle of my crisis, in the middle of my storm, I didn't doubt the compassion and goodness, but I made a commitment to pause. Some of y'all need to stop. In your storm, you get ADD, elemental P, you move so quick, you're trying to fix things and do things on your own, you're trying to strive. And, but what if you could just pause and you recall the past and you recall the past time he has been compassionate, he has shown up. You recall that God has been good to me. Ecclesiastes says, listen, Man, you face these crooked and windy roads, the wind and the storms, the, the rain clouds that are coming, but put your hand to the plow. You got purpose to do. I mean, no, number one, storms will come. My option, my great option is to recall the past. Number two, the next fact about storms. Storms are most likely beyond your control, especially for these disciples. Storms are beyond your control. So if you're, you're putting the solve to that, from the that, trust in his promises. Trust in his promises. I talk about this a lot. I hate this one because I like to control everything. And that never works. I, I need you to get some background here. There was a common belief or, or in Jewish culture that there was a parallel between pictures of the sea or pictures of storm or pictures of water throughout the Bible that showed powerful imagery that represented evil. So you get this picture that this image of the sea or the water shows evil or chaos. So, so they're raised with that kind of mentality, that kind of concept, that kind of culture, that everything bad came out of the sea. And the opposite of God's kingdom was out of the sea. What do we see from the beginning in, in Genesis chapter one? It says he's hovering over the surfaces of the deep, bring, bringing chaos, bringing order to chaos, right? What do we see? Pictures of the flood. How do, how do they come in? They rise up from the sea. They're always coming up with destruction. What does he even say the enemy does? He comes in like a flood, right? He comes in and he comes up. We'll get to this in a minute, but when Jesus heals the demon-possessed man at the garrison, there's, he's possessed with over 2,000 demons, and, and they throws themselves, the, the demons say, can we go into the pigs? Where do the pigs go? In, into, into, the, into the sea. And to see Revelation 13, our apocalyptic literature of the Bible, it says that the opposing force of God, there's a picture of a beast. Where does it say he comes from? In Revelation 13, verse one, it says, I saw a beast rising out of the sea, right? And then at the very end in Revelation 21, it says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Who can't wait for that? Just a side note. There's a new heaven and a new earth and the first earth that passed away. And it says the sea was no more. So there's this imagery in this picture that the turmoil in the sea represented that those forces that opposed God and his kingdom. 
And so now you got to get where the disciples are. Not only was this a severe storm, but they probably have some of this knowledge. They probably have some of this culture ingrained in him, believing that some demonic stuff is actually happening on the boat. Why would they believe it? Who do they have in their boat? The Messiah is in their boat. They have the guy who performs the miracles. And now what? The demonic oppression is coming after the guy who performs the miracles out of the sea to attack him. And he's sleeping. We need to wake him up. They're coming to get you, Jesus. It's like a horror movie. It doesn't look good. You see, the idea, now here, here's the catch. The many things that we're facing, they're beyond our control. Whether it's the sinful world, sinful people, sinful behavior, the flesh stuff, whether it's spiritual battles, whether it's the principalities and powers and rulers in high places, whether it's even what Solomon says that God is using it, storms are often beyond our control. And let me tell you, that is the most difficult part because often I can't fix it. And that's what we struggle with the most. When we face a thing in our relationship, when we face a thing in our marriage, when we face the things with our kids, when we face the thing on the job, when we face that thing, our immediate response is, is to go into fix it mode and, and we can't. So look at what the disciples do. They're, look at where their minds go. The waves broke over the boat. We were near the swamp. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on the cushion. And the first thing he says, teacher, don't you care? The next line, it says, if we drowned. They doubt the care, and now what do they do? They jump to worst case scenario. Anybody some worst case scenario people? We're realist, right? We're just realist. The glass is half empty, and it's just we're realist. And we do this thing where we rationalize. And the disciples woke him up. Don't you care if we drown? Some translations, don't you care if we die? Don't you care if we die? Isn't that what we do in our storm, in our tunnel vision? Jesus is on a soggy pillow and we're going to die. We feel swamped. The demonic oppression is coming at us. It's raging. And so we jump into the worst negative scenario that our minds will let us go. I've been transparent on this before, but I'm gonna tell you again, I'm not a good patient. Two reasons, the first reason is obvious. It's because I've never had a baby. So I can't, I don't know the full experience of pain, but in general, I'm a wimp. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a good, I'm not a good patient. Like if I get the flu, I will announce this is the worst case of the flu that the world has ever seen. <laughs> Kids, we got to go into quarantine. Do not touch me. Talk to me. You do not trust me. You don't want this. I'm barely hanging on, on here. Call an ambulance. Take me in. We'll pay the $800 fee. I feel terrible. I'm always like, you got like a 99, buddy. Toughen up. You haven't had a baby. Um, I get a paper cut, you know, my whole hand's falling off. I will never hold my children again. Good thing I'm, I didn't make the pro sports league because I would never be able to function. Like, worst, anyway, worst, it's worst case scenario. It's the worst thing that happens. So how do, how do we combat these natures, these things that we do, because storms are hard. You see, look, I, I need you to get this statement. When you're looking at worst case scenario, you're looking at the things that Jesus is not doing as opposed to who he is. He's asleep. How can he sleep? There's demonic, there's things going on in my life. You're, you're looking at the things he's not doing as opposed to his character and his promises and, the, and, and his nature and, and, who, and who he is. So what do you do? You, here's the solve. You trust his promises. Now this, go, this goes hand in hand with what we just talked about. Not only do I recall the past miracles and victories and what he's brought me through, but now how many thankful I can trust in him for my future promises, what he's given me as a child of God. I will tell you what I have discovered personally is that when the storm hits me and it's hit me from every direction, I have a firm foundation in his word that I can stand on. I have a source in the Holy Spirit that I can lean into. I have a confidence in the wisdom and the promises of God that he's spoken to me and I can stand on those. Somebody like, I don't, 
I don't know how to get those promises. Let me just give you a couple. Again, we did this over Christmas, but I want to share it to you again because I love doing it. Psalms, just write these references down. You probably aren't going to see them on the screen. Just write them down. If you need a promise, write these down. Psalm 68, 19. Praise be the Lord, our God, our Savior, who daily bears our burdens. I got two amens. We'll keep going. Isaiah 41, 10. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous hand. You're in the very hand of God. Your theology needs new covenant. I got you. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3. It says, praise be to God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of all compassion. When you doubt his compassion, jump into Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Jump in there. He comforts us in our troubles so that we can comfort those who trouble. For we ourselves receive that from God. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. No temptation is overtaking you except common to man. Mankind, For God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. Anybody thankful for that? But when you're tempted, he will also provide a way out where you can endure it, even in the storm, even in the temptation, even in the crisis. Some of you aren't convinced. Well, Paul says, I'm convinced that neither death, nor angels, nor demons, nor present, nor future, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. You get into these promises and it changes you in the storm. It's your source. And so what if, got to thinking, what if in the middle of storm, I didn't jump to worst case scenario but I stood on his word. I got these promises in my heart and in my spirit. I understand that, yes, there are winds. Yes, there's a storm cloud brewing. Yes, there are waves crashing and it looks crazy and it looks demonic, but we serve a God who has all authority, all power, all dominion, and I can trust in his word. What was, the, what was just the very present word that they got? Let's go to the other side. Like, like okay. That could have been a really fun boat ride. There's rapids, there's things going on. They said other boats followed them. You could talk trash to them. We got Jesus in our boat. We're heading to the suckers. You guys are going under, but we're, he told me, we're, like, what would happen if they would have trusted? It, it could, uh, he said, we're going to the other side. The disciples doubted that he cared and jumped a worst case scenario. Why? Because storms will come and storms are often beyond your control. Number three, next fact, last fact about storms. Storms are unpredictable. Anybody like predictable? I like predictable. Predictable is my preference, yes. So if they're unpredictable, I have to understand his purpose. I'm telling you, this, this is going to help you. They just finished up the disciples again, being a part of the most amazing teaching of all time. And they get in the boat, and the storm comes. Look at, look at the disciples. He says, he's in the stern, sleeping on the kitchen, uh, on the cushion. He says, teacher, don't you care if we drown? And I, lo I love verse 39. It says, he got up. I feel like he got up a little flustered. Guys, I'm trying to get a nap in. Knuckleheads. Why are you flipping out? Why are you anxious? Why, are you, why do you got ADD right now? What's your problem? Come on. Uh, and, I, and he got up, and it says, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, quiet. Be still. I don't think he was just talking to the waves. I think he's talking to a group of stirred disciples that are frustrated and flustered and anxious and worried. Is it quiet? How about everything just be quiet? He messed up my nap. Quiet, be still. Look at this. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. And he said to the disciples, he says two things. Why are you so afraid do you still have no faith? Why are you so afraid do you still have no faith? And look at their response. They were terrified, now they're speaking, and they asked each other, who is this? You see, I think that's part of the problem in our storm. Some of them aren't close, us to know, close enough to Jesus to know who he is, his character and his power and his might. They were missing that. Who is this that even the wind and the waves? Two things, you have no faith, and they ask, who is this? Here's the whole point. They missed it. Up until now, they had been following Jesus and the Messiah. Watch this. And the predictability was that he was going to be the one that would overthrow the Roman rule. 
The predictability, it's predictable. Yes, he's the Messiah. Oh, this guy's healing. He's teaching. Oh man, this is awesome. And I'm a fisherman, but I'm in the inner circle. And this is really cool. This is the one that we can predict what's gonna happen. And here's how we see it. We see the writing on the wall. He's gonna free us from oppression. I'll get to eat all the fattening foods. I'll sit on his right and he'll be king and I'll be like a prince and it'll be great. And they have this thought going out. His teaching's revolutionary and it's awesome. But now he's sleeping in the stern and demonic oppression is rising up and waves are crashing and it's unpredictable. So now Jesus stands up in the boat. How many thankful with all authority? He shuts it down, be still. And then it, and then it gets real and it gets heavy and he calls them out for, for their lack of faith. He says, why are you still so afraid? Now watch this. Their fear shifts from the storm now to the man. Why? Because they don't understand him. They don't really know him, and it terrifies them. You see, when you don't understand who's in your boat, you miss it. When you don't understand who's in your boat, you miss it. When you don't understand the power he possesses, you miss it. When you don't understand his mission and where he's going in the boat and the direction of the boat, you miss it. And it can be scary and terrifying. You see, here's what the disciples didn't get. His mission was unpredictable to them. His mission was different. Everything they had predicted for the Messiah movement didn't involve storms. It definitely didn't involve Samaritans. Definitely didn't involve Samaritan women. It definitely didn't involve women caught in adultery. It it definitely didn't involve ministering to leper camps and touching the unclean. It It definitely didn't involve the crucifixion. It definitely didn't involve the pain and the wrath of sin upon his shoulders and the weight of that. I'm telling you, listen, you gotta get this. The purpose of Jesus in that moment in Mark chapter four was to get to the other side. Why? The other side was the region of the Gerasene. The Gerasene was a pretty important region where four cities would intersect. And in this region, there was a man and that man was naked and he screamed all day and all night and he was possessed by demons. And Jesus's heart broke for that man ahead of time. He's cutting himself day and night. He hung out with the dead. No chains could bind him. You see, Jesus' purpose is always redemption. It's always to break the chains that bind. It was prophesied in Isaiah 61, but they read it wrong. He says, I'm proclaiming good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, proclaim freedom. What was he? He was captive by the chains to proclaim freedom, to release the prisoner. The darkness that he held, I'm, I'm here to bring light, to proclaim favor, beauty instead of the ashes of the tomb. He is, he is visiting the calling of Isaiah 61. It's his purpose and it was his mission. That spirit of heaviness, I'm gonna replace it with joy. That spirit of despair, I'm gonna make it light and you will be clothed and in your right mind. See, his purpose for the man, that was it, to put it in his right mind, to redeem and to transform. Watch, this man would beg to come with Jesus, but Jesus gave him a purpose gave him an assignment and he became the first witness, the first missionary to the region of the Gerasene where four cities intersected because it was bigger than him. How do you combat this unpredictability, this uncertainty? You gotta understand your purpose. You gotta get some faith. You see, when you know who's in your boat, your life begins to change. When you know who's in in your boat, it's just not about you and your storm. Your mission changes. Your heart becomes about people who are lost, who are broken, who are bound in the chains of this world. Solomon puts it in this perspective. Put your hands on the plow. You got work to do. Quit looking at the circumstances in the situation. I've got, a, I've got a mission bigger. I need you to scatter the seed of the gospel, the good news of Jesus everywhere you go. You can't look at the storm and do what I've called you to do. His mission is always people. And when I know he's in my boat and I grab a hold of his purpose, it changes the outlook of my storm. 
I, uh, we have a gentleman in the hospital right now. He's going back for treatment this week. He's just a strong man. He's battling cancer. And I don't know the right name of it and I'll probably get it wrong anyways, but it's cancer in his blood. And he's going through treatments literally where they take blood out and plasma out, everything out. They fill him up with radiation and they basically replace his blood, hoping his blood would reproduce, his white cells would reproduce properly. And technology's crazy. And he's sitting on his, like his third round of treatment and I visit him, I visit him in the hospital. You see this strong man, just the hat and kind of struggling. I said, hey, say, I, I don't even know. I don't even know how to relate. I don't even know how to empathize with you. I said, hey, what, what can I pray with you for? I'm like, oh, duh, he's got cancer. And he makes this statement. He said, Jason, this hall is rough. Nobody on this hall has hope. Would you pray that I could be a witness of hope? He didn't ask for healing. He didn't ask for healing. He has to be a witness. I'm in the elevator. I'm broken because I complain so much, worst case scenario so much. And he believes God can heal him and wants God to heal him. But his prayer request, let me be a better witness of the goodness of God in the middle of my storm. And it blew, it blew my mind. Do you know that Jesus is in you? He's inside of your boat. And I'm, I mean, thankful he'll show up, he'll rescue, he quiets the storm, he calms the storm. And the good news is he has a purpose on the other side. So here's the catch, here's the whole thing and the unpredictability. Don't be terrified. Why? He's got power over the demonic oppression and the waves and the storm and all of it. And in one word, he speaks, close, right mind. I don't have for a bonus, time for a bonus, but I'm gonna give it to you anyways. I had this thought, the disciples said, who is this man? They didn't even know him. Yet the demons pegged him in the first encounter. The disciples said, who is this? The demons say, what do you want from us? Jesus, son of the most high. And if, if you and I could understand that he is son of the most high God, that demons tremble in fear at his name, that he has all authority, power, splendor, and majesty, and that he's in our boat, and his whole purpose is to restore and redeem and to rescue. And how would that change the outlook of your storm? As we close today, the title is Built for the Storm. And what if at Faith Somerville, we could realize that you are actually built for the storm. Why? Because storms will come. Most of them are out of your control and they are very unpredictable. But what if we could make the commitment that in that moment to pause, to recall the past, that in that moment of no control, out of control, I could just say, he said, this, go to the other side. And I trust in his promises. And what if even in the middle of that storm, whether he heals me or not, he's got a bigger purpose in my life to seek and save that which is lost, to bring the good news of the gospel of Jesus. See, our temptation is always in the test and the trial is always to be shaken. It, those shake you. Solomon says your temptation is to look at the rain cloud and to see the wind. Your temptation is to stop sowing and start complaining, to stop sowing, to worry, to be 
anxious, your, your, your temptation when the waves and the wind and the hurt and the pain and the attack of the many, why? It's easy to doubt that he cares and to get tunnel vision. It's easy to jump to worst case scenario and to be negative and really focus on what he's not doing as opposed to who he is. And this one's hard for me, but it's easy to be really selfish and not understand who's in your boat. Maybe because that's big and scary. Some of you are like, Jason, I, I, feel, I feel like you talk about this once a quarter. Remember the promises of the word. I feel like you talk about this every month. I feel like you, I feel like you talk about this a lot. And I will tell you because the storm's a part of my DNA, because I've been in one, I faced one. And when your mom gets in a car accident and your world is shattered and things are turned upside down and you don't know where it came from or why, you got, you got two options. You can fold up or you can trust that still in the tragedy, he is the God who works all things together for the good. You can trust that though he slay me, I will rejoice. You can trust that he still work. You can trust that he still, why do you teach on it all the time? Because it's the story that echoes throughout eternity that even in the middle of crisis, we serve a God that's on his throne and the righteous are never forsaken, that he is the author, the perfecter, that he gives mercy and grace. And I say this all the time, if all he did was forgive me of my sins and not give me one other blessing, I deserve to give him my life and service because he's that good. It's in my DNA. The wisest man, Solomon, says if you focus on the wind and the rain, it'll mess with your harvest. It'll mess with your purpose. Jesus kind of takes it to the next level in Matthew chapter seven. Everyone who hears the words of mine and does them will be like Solomon, will be like the wise man. What did that wise man do? Who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came. It doesn't say by happenstance, it says the rains happened. It was unpredictable, it came in. The rains fell and the floods came and the wind blew and beat on the house. The squall, it overlapped the bow of the boat. The house did not fall because it was founded on the rock. It was founded on the rock. I guess as we close this morning, what if our foundation over and over and over and over again was Jesus and he promised to be in our boat, to be in our boat, that maybe, maybe you and I, instead of doubting, instead of the fear, instead of the anxiety, instead, maybe you and I were built for the storm because God's creating a testimony and a story inside of you that will shape and change the world. Bow your heads and close your eyes with me. Father, today I thank you for your word. God, I thank you that you are here. God, there are so many in the room that feel like they're being buffeted. Literally the waves are, are coming over right now. Their marriage is being buffeted. Their things are happening. God, we thank you. Even what we heard in our hosting moment, that your name bears weight, your name changes things. And so Father, today I pray, I pray, Lord, that there would be an encouragement in the Holy Spirit. God, that you would, you would again be the lifter of our head. God, that we would understand your power, your authority, your might. God, some of us have been jaded because the storm has, has wrecked our foundation. But God, today I pray that you would be the God who restores, who renews, that God, when we read your word and we look on your character and, and when, we, when we intercede in the Holy Spirit, God, you would restore those things that the enemy has devoured. Because God, you call us to sow. You call us to, you call us to spread the seed of your good news and your gospel. And it's bigger than us. It's bigger than our circumstance. God, we don't minimize the circumstance, but God, we know that you are Lord, you are King, despite the circumstance. And so today, as a church body, we make a commitment to surrender things we can't control that are trying to control. We make, 
We make a commitment to look to you instead of the worst case scenario, to look at who you are instead of looking at what you're not doing. God, we make a commitment to trust that your heart and purpose for us is to spread the seed of the good news of the gospel to our sphere of influence, to our family members, to those who don't know you. And Lord, we will trust you even in the storm. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're in here and you'd say, hey, Pastor Jason, um, I'm in a storm right now. I'm struggling right now. I, there's, there's some things going on at my work and my family. There's some things going on in, in, in my heart and my spirit. There's some, there's some things I'm facing. I'm facing some hurt and some pain and some stuff right now. And I need to let some things go because my mind is on that teetering point of the doubt and the fear and the anxiety and the worry. And I need to surrender some things today. If you're in here and you just say, Pastor Jason, I'm, I'm walking through that storm. If that's you, can you just lift up your hand so I know who to pray for? Man, hands going up all over, amen, amen, amen. Maybe some of you would just say, hey, Pastor Jason, I'm gonna be honest. I've been having a lot of tunnel vision just for my own stuff, my own problems, the own things going on in my, in my life. I, I'm facing some things. Yeah, I'm facing some storms at work, but I, I, I'm tended to lock. And I just, need, I just need fresh vision today. I just need, I need fresh vision from the Holy Spirit to refresh me, to revive me, to renew me. I, I've got some things that I've inherited from parents. I've got some things that I've inherited from situations. I've got some hurt and pain that I've had that I'm now projecting on others. We had a prophetic word come up that there's, there's a critical spirit that just, that you've been raised with and now you're, you're walking with that critical spirit and God needs to release you of that today to expand your vision bigger than you, to let go of the hurt, to let go of the verbal abuse, to let go of that stuff and start moving in the newness and freshness of the Lord. If you just say, Pat, I, I, I need some fresh vision today. I need to look at this. I need promises for my life. I need promises for my kids today. If that's you, can you raise your hand and look at me? Amen, amen. And lastly, and I, and I think I would be remiss to do this, but if you say, hey, Pastor Jason, I'm like the guy in chains. I'm not, I'm not where I should be with the Lord. I've been seeking all the wrong stuff. I've been pursuing all the wrong stuff. I feel like I'm walking amongst the dead. I feel like I've got these ashes over. I feel like I got stuff over my life. And everything you said about Jesus, I need that in my life. I need that refreshing. I need to surrender my will, my control in my life to Jesus because everything I'm leading to is, is it's not going the right direction. And I need, I need to surrender to the Lord today. I'm not living right for him. If that's you again, one more time with every head bowed, every head Could you raise your hand so I know who to pray for? Amen. Can you stand to your feet with me? Our altar team's coming down right now. Uh, God, God spoke this to me in first service and, and normally, normally I don't push really hard, but, um, but he, he spoke to me this morning and just said, look, there are people in your congregation that raise your hand for encouragement and prayer and they have the line that says, I'll take care of this in my quiet time later. And, and God just told me this morning in my quiet time, he wants you to deal with it now. And he wants you to let it go at these altars. And these altars, man, with this call, there's so many people, there's, there's probably 75 hands that went up. But man, it's, it's a chance for you to let some things go, not to embarrass you. There's power and agreement where we bear one another's burdens and we put those before the Lord. So I'm gonna ask you to do a bold step. If you raised your hand or you didn't and God's dealing with something, we just wanna pray with you. There's nothing, there's nothing crazy or spooky about it. We just wanna pray with you and lift you up and give you that opportunity for surrender this morning. So I'm gonna pray one more time. If you didn't raise your hand, things are, things are going great. I love this song because it sings the name of Jesus, that he is worthy, that he deserves honor, that he deserves glory. So, so you say, hey, I'm good right now. I'm not in the storm. I will tell you, you may be facing one or you may be coming out of one. Can we, can we just put his name in rightful place? as we sing this song together, as we close. And if you need prayer, I'm gonna invite you forward. Father, today I thank you for your word. I thank you that you're here. I pray in these next few moments that you change hearts and lives. God, that you would speak redemption, you would speak hope, you would speak truth. And God, we're gonna leave some things down here and surrender. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray.